Hi, my name is Clinton Erling, and I'm the president of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The Chamber's Business Review is an informative weekly television magazine of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We will showcase the activities of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, feature interviews of prominent business personalities, and broadcast our popular training seminars for the entire country's benefit. So please sit back and enjoy while we indulge your attention over the next half an hour. Welcome to this weekly business review program by the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce. My name is Kit Nascimento and I will be hosting uh, today's program. We are extremely fortunate uh, to have Brigadier David Granger, who is also the leader of the opposition, uh, and especially fortunate because we are going to be focusing on security, national security, matters of security. And I don't think we could have anyone uh, better qualified in the studio than the Brigadier to talk about it. So David, if I may call you David. Sure. Um, let me first ask you to give your own sort of review, if you like, of, of where we are with security right now in Guyana. Thank you, Kit. Um, in general terms, I feel that uh, security could best be measured by the impact it has on the individual citizen, what I call human, human safety. And we must look at it uh, from the point of view of what happens to women and children, what happens to fisher folk, what happens to minors, what happens to business people, people going about their daily lives, you know, how safe are they? And um, that is my first yardstick. Uh, at a higher level, we must look at what happens in, in the communities, um, in organizations. For example, the business community. Is the, does the business community feel safe? Or does it have to take extra measures to protect its, uh, its business, its, its um, resources, its property? And then you could look at it at a higher level, at the national level. Um, is the country safe? Is the country secure? Is it secure from uh, transnational crime? Uh, are its borders safe? Border secure. Um, can people bring in guns? Could uh, cocaine or other illegal substances come into the country? Is there illegal migration? So I look at uh, security at all three levels um, national, institutional, and personal. And I do feel that um, there are challenges at all three levels. And I generally, people feel unsafe. I know that people in the diaspora who want to come back feel that uh, they are likely to be killed on the roads, somebody's likely to come in their homes, and as a result of that, some people are hesitant to come back to their homeland. Well, as president of the, uh, the Tourism Association, and being in the tourism business myself, I can, uh, I can certainly say that where uh, the tourism business is concerned, uh, if people don't feel safe in the country that they are planning to spend their holidays in, they won't come. Well, that is quite true. And, um, and that in includes the diaspora too? That's right. Well, tourists generally, you yes. know, people want to relax and feel safe. I do feel that uh, the diaspora is quite large. It's a potential market to be exploited. But many are hesitant to return home because every time they see news of uh, a person coming back home, maybe for a wedding or funeral, and the person get, is attacked, you know, I think uh, waves go through the diaspora and they say, oh, I'm not coming back home. Well, our media tends to report very dramatically every time there is a major uh, security brief of any kind, whether it's, whether it's murders, um, drugs, um, it makes the headlines. My question to you is, um, and the government will often say that uh, the media are responsible for giving this poor impression of Guyana uh, rather than um, the facts of the matter. Uh, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that the media is, 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 uh, is irresponsibly representing the reality in Guyana or are they representing and reporting the reality? I think they're pretty accurately reporting the, uh, the reality. And sometimes the analysis might be a bit flawed, but I think statistically, 
there's little doubt about um, our murder rates, for example. It is, it is known that the murder rates in 2013 are about the same as they were in 2005 when Fine Man was alive. Um, uh, the figures are there. Um, every month, there are at least two uh, domestic murders. You know, at least 24 women get killed every year. Um, and, and so it goes on when you look at traffic accidents. Guyana's rate of accidents is higher than that of the United States. Murder rate is higher than that. The rate higher than that of the United Kingdom. You're talking so, about per head of population? Yeah, per capita population. Mm -hmm. And um, these are not untruths. And I think the role of the media um, is a very important one because it is a symptom. It's al it alerts the population. It alerts the government to something that has gone wrong and something that needs to be put right. If the media were silent, if it suppressed the news, I think a lot of what is going wrong in security would, would continue. So the media, I think, is performing an important role. I don't think they're deliberately scaring tourists away, but the government must pay attention to what people are thinking. And if the media, is, uh, if the media are reporting what the people are thinking, well, then the government needs to set up and take notice. So. You clearly feel that there's a lot wrong. There is a lot wrong. How would your party, if it were in government, begin to approach this? Well, uh, we do have a, a pretty clear vision. We don't have a blueprint. Obviously, when you go into government, you will see the files that the government has. You will have access to the data, to the reports. But my own investigation um, over the last 15 years or so um, would show that there is a huge body of recommendations. Studies have been done starting from about 1999. 15 years ago, the United Kingdom, through the DFID, the Department for Foreign uh, International Development, uh, sent down uh, the regional security advisor, Paul Mathias. So from 1999, I have records of reports submitted to the government of Guyana to improve security. From 1999, in 2000, based on the 1999 study, um, a firm called Capita Simmons uh, produced a voluminous report submitted to Minister Gadraj on the reform of the entire police force and, and the sector. And then when the, the trouble, what I call the troubles, started on the East Coast in 2001, 2002, President Jagdeo himself promulgated a menu of measures, provided money. He went up to Scotland Yard himself. He met Baroness Amos. Um, teams started to come down almost every year. And this culminated in 2007 when uh, the head of the Presidential Secretariat, uh, Dr. Roger Luncheon, signed an agreement with the British High Commissioner, uh, Mr. Fraser Wheeler, for uh, an over three million pounds sterling security sector reform action plan. Yeah, the private sector commission and the chamber actually were very involved in that. Uh, also, uh, in fact, they were supporting it. Well, there were several studies. There must be a dozen studies over the last 15 years. And um, it is my view that uh, those studies could be the basis on which APNU would form its security sector reform. Well, plan. tell me something. Was uh, when when the British uh, security sector reform pro program, which is what it became generally called, mm -hmm. uh, was developing and taking place? Was the opposition involved in that? I was involved. Um, I don't know the extent to which the opposition was consulted, mm. but I was involved when the British teams came in. They would speak with me, and um, you were not then the leader of the opposition. No, I was not the leader right. of the opposition. Right. In fact, I don't think APNU had been established yet. No, no. <laughs> right. It was only established in 2011, a few months before right. the election. Um, I don't know if the PNC was formally consulted, but. Uh, I was uh, involved at other levels too. In the year 2000, uh, Mr. Ronald Gadraj, then the Minister of Home Affairs, set up something called the National Security Strategy Planning Committee. Mm -hmm. In 2000, this is like 14 years ago, I was mm -hmm. there. Then um, something called the Border National Security Commission was established. I was a member. Then in 2003, the Disciplined Forces Commission 
was established on the Justice Ian Chang. I was a member of that. So I was a member, uh, and the People's National Congress before knew what I was doing, of course. But we all supported um, those measures. And up to 2003, 2004, uh, the Discipline Forces Commission report made 71 recommendations for the police force alone, out of, out of 164 recommendations. 71 were the police force. But up to the present time, all of those recommendations were not implemented. Are you actually saying to me that none of those 71, did you say? 71. 71 recommendations that arose out of the, that program, none have been Im implemented? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying some of the essential ones about police training, recruitment uh, of officers, police emoluments, some of the essential ones have not changed. Uh, because they were wide-ranging, they dealt with uh, inquest, they dealt with um, investigation of indiscipline within the police ranks, the role of the Office of Professional Responsibility, the role of the Police Complaints Authority. And Justice Kennard came before the commission and he pointed out that, uh, well he didn't use the word, but my expression was that he was basically a postman. Uh, members of the public would make complaints to him, but he had no capability to investigate those complaints. He had to send the complaints to the police against whom the complaints had been made in the first place and await the response, and some of the responses were quite, quite dilatory, um, before um, a determination could be made to the, chain, to, the, to the case. So he made recommendations that he should have his own team of investigators. So when members of the public approached him, he would say, oh, go out and investigate, you know, and bring back a report. But it doesn't happen. So many of those recommendations are embedded in the Discipline Forces Commission report, and those recommendations have not been implemented. So it's not total, but I haven't gone through the 71 recommendations to determine which ones have and which ones have not been. What would you consider to be the fundamental ones, the ones that would make the, the, the biggest impact in the soonest period of time? Training. Training the police, the they police. have to be um, retrained at all levels, they must be retrained. Uh, and the training has to build in, or, or values have to be built in. Um, because I think the police were built as, or, or they evolved as a force. They go out there and charge people. But they don't go out and solve problems. And the police is badly on the strength. So for example, uh, you have the hinterland, the place where gold is mined, the place where Contraband is smuggled, the place where tourism could be developed, but the police are hopelessly under strength. How badly? Badly under strength because they, for example, in the, what is called the F Division, the whole hinterland, literally from Maburumo right down to Shalt, and most of Region 7, Region, most of Region 1, 7, 8, and 9. And where's the commander for that division? Rabbit Walk Evelary. He's not even at Bartica. Mm. He doesn't even have a boat. He can't fly in and look at his area of responsibility. So we feel that, you know, training, police need to be retrained. The police need to be paid better. But you were also talking about equipping. Then, yes, well, they need aircraft. Mm. <laughs> You've got an 1,100-kilometer border with Brazil alone. And Brazil is the world's fifth largest exporter of small arms. Well, do you therefore think that we should be devoting, I'll, I'll bring it back to the training, but. Do you think we should be, the country should be devoting a far greater budget to security than it, than it does? Well, it's not necessarily at this point in time how much it, it, it spends, it's how it's spent. Mm. And I would say that more has to be spent on training. And there's no point giving untrained policemen um, bigger weapons or more vehicles. You know, that is why we have not supported the, the SWAT, the Special Weapons and Tactics Team, because that is not where the problem is. The problem is on the street. The problem is the relationship between the policemen and the citizens. The problem is what's taking place in quarantine. The problem is what's taking place with the uh, matter of um, Mr. Colvin Harding, who um, accused the police of torture. It is the relationship between that constable and that citizen. And that is where we feel training has to, has to start. Give the constable, give a crooked constable a car, it's not going to solve crime. But doesn't, uh, I mean, haven't the police force always traditionally had a, an established training program? They have a cadet uh, training program. All of that seems to be in place. 
Well, I would, I would like to feel that um, one of the, well, I do know for sure that one of the recommendations of the Discipline Forces Commission was to set up a proper officer academy. I know that a building was constructed in Evlery. I don't know if um, that is meant to be that officer academy. I know when I was in Defense Force myself, um, police cadet officers uh, were sent for training on the Ghana Defense Force uh, um, officers course, standard officers course, but that's a military course. It was always expected that after completing that course, they would have proper police training. So we look back at the training that was given to cadet officers in the generation of um, Laurie Lewis and Norman McLean, Balram Ragabir, and we felt that there could be some system in which officers would be given or persons selected for officer training would be given accelerated promotion. But essentially, the training of the officer has to suit modern crime, transnational crime. Um, and we need people who go into forensic, we need people who go into specialized area, areas of policing. I don't know if that's happening now. Is it, is it that the police force um, are simply have not caught up with a modern era of cri crime that, say, 30, 40 years ago, the country wasn't thre threatened with? Is that, is that a, are you saying that that's a fundamental part of the problem? It is a part of the problem. Uh, but I do not know the inner workings of the police force. For example, a matter of computerization. Uh, if somebody enters the country legally uh, at, at uh, Springlands or Skeldon, for example, you know, is that record traced to find out whether the person goes to Marches Ridge, whether the person goes to Lethem, maybe using Guyana as a transit point for drugs or something? I don't know how well um, developed the IT system is within the police force. Well, you surprise me a bit when you say that. You are, after all, the leader of the opposition. Yeah. You could, at any significant time, become the leader of the government. Mm -hmm. you're, you, you already lead a party that has a parliamentary majority. Don't you make it your business to see that you are informed? Don't you meet with the commission of police? Uh, I'm, I'm surprised. No, well, there is some information we seek um, on the floor of the National Assembly, but uh, some of the organizations are opaque. For example, we see closed-circuit television cameras going on, going, you know, being erected around the city, but we don't know what happens to the information. Um, and uh, there's no way you can squeeze that information out of the Ministry of Home Affairs or the Ghana Police Force. Um, Do you meet no regularly with the Commissioner? No, I don't meet with the commission. I meet. I have met him on occasions. I've Is met that him on because you, he doesn't make himself available? No, I haven't. I haven't sought meetings with him. Um, outside, uh, there's a shadow minister who who meets with him. Um, Mr. Vincent Felix is the right. shadow minister. And when I, I say you, I really meant the party. Yeah, well, yeah. There is a there is a, uh, a program of meeting between Mr. Felix and Mr. Um, well, he, Mr. Brummel. Felix himself was a commissioner. That's right, but he is not given the type of information that we are seeking. And that is when we go back to the floor of the National Assembly. Have you read that complaint in the, in the National no, Assembly? No, not the complaint about the inadequacy of information, mm. because it is there in the record anyway. Mm. Um, let me take you back, because we've left it a little bit, to what you would do when you come into office. If you, tomorrow you come into office for, for the sake of argument. You consider, from all you've said so far, that security is a very vital and, and a problem that we have to adjust, That's great. We, have, we have to address. Um, what would be the, do you, do, does APNU or does the opposition collectively have um, a security policy in, uh, in their back pocket? Well, we don't have a plan. We have a policy. We have an approach to security. And that's what I described initially at the mm. three, looking at security at three levels. The individual or personal level of human safety, the organizational institutional level, um, you know, looking after, you know, the, the community, looking after business. In other words, what you were saying, I think, earlier on, is mm. that you measure the success 
or failure of the security on how safe the nation is exactly. in all of those areas. But in, in those, at those three levels, we have to plan to make improvements. For example, at the highest level, at the transnational, national and transnational level, we have to engage um, in what is called you know, Caribbean-based security cooperation. Uh, the United States has taken the lead in that uh, Caribbean-based security initiative. But it is my view, although that is necessary, it's not sufficient because America is looking after its own interests. America wants to uh, prevent um, illegal weapons from going into the, their country, wants to prevent illegal drugs from going into the country. And those are their priorities. But well, we may have other priorities. Um, we may want to prevent um, illegal drugs from entering Guyana. Or we may want to um, prosecute um, persons who, involve, who are involved in drug trafficking. So well, at that level, we have to have international cooperation with the Caribbean and with um, countries like uh, or bordering countries, uh, Venezuela, Suriname, and Brazil, and certainly with the United States. Do you feel that uh, Guyana is a, a major transshipment? <laughs> it is a major transshipment point. And every year, the United States publishes something called International Narcotics Control Strategy Report. And I reckon from about 2000 or thereabouts, they use that expression um, almost as part of a ritual. The um, Guyana is a transshipment point for narcotics. And if it's going to be a transshipment point, then inevitably, I would imagine, uh, drugs will get into the, the system for local use as well. Well, that, so that doesn't seem to be a major problem yet, or, or is it? Well, we don't know. We don't have the statistics, but you see people on the street who are assumed to be um, uh, drug abusers, uh, victims of drug abuse. You know? What do you think the, uh, the major threat to the country, its people, its safety, its stability from the narcotic trade? The major threat is that um, narcotics trade cannot be taken in isolation. It is part of a, a criminal network which brings in guns as well. So wherever you find a narcotics trade, you find gun running. And wherever you find narcotics trade, you find money laundering. Mm. So it, it becomes part of a package. And wherever you find narcotics trade, the police, the judiciary, law enforcement officers are going to be subject of attack by the narco traffickers because they want uh, the police or whoever to turn a blind eye, the revenue officers to By turn a blind eye. By attack, you mean corruption? Graft, graft, corruption, yes. And so when we speak of narcotics trafficking, you're not simply talking about an aircraft coming into the country um, and, and couriers taking the drugs out. You're talking about um, a crime that penetrates um, the law enforcement agency. It's almost like um, AIDS, you know, it, it attacks all the organs of the body because it cannot survive if the police force and the revenue authority, you know, are alert and vigilant. It cannot survive if the magistracy is firm and harsh. But realistically, David, a, a country like ours, we don't pay, even with the best will in the world, very huge salaries to our security personnel. Uh, a sergeant in the police these days earns, what, something like 70,000? Yes, about that they expect. Yeah. Uh, is it not when a country like us is threatened by, by the narcotic trade, is it not relatively easy with the money that's generated by the nar narcotic trade to buy off that sergeant, say, just look the other way? Well, and how do you deal with that? Well, you deal with that by making sure the sergeant is well trained. You deal with it by making sure that there is a, a supervisory um, framework within the police force. You deal with that by making sure that the, the other institutions of the government, of the state, for example, the magistracy and the judiciary function. And you, do, you deal with that by ensuring that the sergeant is adequately paid. Now, the, the question is not a matter of whether he gets $80,000 or not, but whether it is a living wage, whether he can actually live on that, or if he still needs to hold his hand out and ask the drivers in the street to say, give me a raise. And we need to find out what is an adequate or what is a living wage, and that is a problem. That That's a problem beyond security, though. It is beyond security, but it's one of the recommendations of the Discipline Forces Commission 
that we found, you know, 10 years ago in, in, in 2004. That uh, many, I have had instances in which I've dealt with individual policemen who simply, they live out of town and they just don't have enough money to travel home and, you know, sometimes you have to help them with a meal. And, you know, the police force and the government must pay attention to that. If a policeman is hungry and he doesn't have trans uh, money to uh, get home, he can't send his child to school, he's going to do strange things. Do you think the police force should be paid differently to the rest of the public service? I believe that um, the police force should have high entrance standards. They should have higher qualification standards. My information is that at present, you require people with um, a sound primary education. I think the standards should be higher. I think at this point in time, we need um, secondary school graduates. And I think they should be, they should be paid higher. I, I do believe that the teachers, the schools, should be the best paid public servants. I've said that mm. before, and I wouldn't deny that. But I don't think the police need to be the best. But they need to be adequately remunerated. And I don't think they're adequately remunerated at this point in time. And that, that causes a lot of problems. The police force also has been demoralized by um, the way the force has been manipulated by the political elite. We had a case in which um, I, can, I can mention, um, without fear of contradiction, that at least um, two commissions of police had the United States visa suspended. I, any yes, idea why? I don't have any idea why, but it caused ripples. I have an idea of the impact it made mm. on the, on the um, morale of the junior members of the police force who felt hugely embarrassed to have a commissioner whose U.S. visa had been suspended. Um, so when something like that happens... That's an unfortunate way, though, to have how we judge our police force by what the Americans do. Well... Uh, the Americans don't uh, do it out of uh, malice or spite, I believe. They must have a good reason. And, um, but it may be a reason that has to do with them, not with us. Well, I don't know the reason the Americans did it, but I can tell you about the impact it had on the juniors within the system mm -hmm. who felt hugely embarrassed. And there's a morale problem if they feel that uh, the minister is interfering in what should be the opportunity police operations, and this is a matter which has affected us, it has certainly affected the APNU. After um, some members of the APNU were shot with rubber pellets on the 6th of December 2011, I wrote uh, Mr. Ramatar calling for an inquiry. There was no inquiry, and we're now going to call for an inquiry in the National Assembly, because a motion is being brought in the National Assembly, after some delay, but a motion is being brought about that shooting. The point I'm making here is that if those events were properly investigated, were properly inquired into, we would prevent worse abuses along the way. So when there is political interference to prevent investigation inquiry or to give directions, um, because the minister came out and spoke out about the, that shooting on, in December 2011, but if nothing is done, the police force continues to behave in the same way, and then we get bigger problems along the way. We get problems in the quarantine, we get problems in Linden. So I do believe that morale is important, and I do believe that political interference has contributed to the demoralization of the police force. And I do believe that when you had a Minister of Home Affairs, like Mr. Ronald Gadraj, whose United States visa was suspended, mm -hmm. um, you are running a, a big risk because it will have an impact. There is no um, way that you can avoid the consequences of, of that. Whether the, the Americans are justified or not, it has an impact. So let's now begin to talk about your views on the way the police force is actually today being run, how it's being managed. Well, a lot has to deal with the quality of training of the entire corps of officers. It's not a one-person show, and um, that is one of the reasons why the Discipline Forces Commission 10 years ago recommended the establishment of a proper officer training college, or police academy, call it what you will, 
so that um, people can be given training and we expected that most of the entrance into the police officer corps would be uh, university graduates, at least they've been exposed to tertiary education. Right now, I do believe that um, people who have simply had a, a sung primary education could become commissioned. I'm not saying this is wrong with anything wrong with a sung primary education, but when you're dealing with transnational crime, when you're dealing with international uh, organization, uh, you need people who have had advanced training in the various aspects of policing. And we feel that the academy would be a means of giving them that training. Uh, that is one point. Um, the second point is that the uh, police must be given the equipment that it needs to do its work. This country is bigger than England, <laughs> geographically. We need aircraft. You cannot patrol this country without aircraft. And boats. And you need boats. You need all-terrain vehicles. And maybe in some areas you also need horses. So we need an officer core in the police force that is thinking in a more dynamic way of going after the criminals. Is there smuggling? Is there piracy? Is there banditry? Let us go after the criminals. You can't sit down in Evil Air, you can't sit down in Rabbit Walk waiting for information to come to you. No, if there's a problem on the quarantine course of piracy, you need to go out there and, and um, get to the pirates. And I don't think it's happening. Um, if there is smuggling of fuel or cocaine, you have to go after the smugglers. And uh, the CANU, the Customs Anti-Narcotics Unit, that's an anomaly. Who really controls it? Is it a part of the police? The police force has its own anti-narcotics unit, but nobody hears about it. And the GRA too, apparently. Well, there you go. And the police are the main um, law enforcement agency and they must be empowered, they must be equipped, they must have laboratories so that when they find this white powder, powdery substance, they can identify it. But I don't think that the police have the technical means to um, do the type of uh, law enforcement that needs to be done. But there has been quite major investment in, in, in scanning machines on the docks, etc. I mean, my government is, does seem to be putting a fair amount of money in that direction. Well, that is itself not without scandal because for one full year, I think it might have been 2011 to 2012, the equipment sat down there and it was never used until they discovered that um, there was a reason for it not being used and drugs were going out in containers, mm -hmm. although a new piece of equipment was there. I don't, know, um, I don't know to what extent it has prevented the uh, exportation of drugs in other, out of other means, for example, uh, people leave Perica and people leave Charity and simply go to Venezuela. Let me ask you a blunt question. You feel that the hierarchy of the police force is corrupted? I think it, is, it has been weakened and it is not empowered, it is not capable of performing its function. I don't think as a whole the hierarchy of the police force is corrupt weakened, or corrupted. Weakened how? Because... And for what reason? Well, for one, um, the, the you training. You training already. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and for two, the, the system of um, giving them the advanced uh, appointments um, which they need, for example, in communications or in crowd control or in other aspects of policing, which maybe are available at other colleges, um, specialized colleges in, in the Caribbean or maybe United Kingdom. You mentioned the academy, and the thought was going through my mind at the time is, isn't there a regional academy? I'm not aware of, of that. I, uh, I'm talking about the basic level I mean, should, for shouldn't, a cadet. Shouldn't, shouldn't there be? An academy is an expensive undertaking, I mean, to, to, even to staff it. Our recommendation was that all of the officers going into the three security forces, which I consider to be police, prisons, and fire, should attend that academy and then um, they can go into fire, go into prisons, as, um, and do their specialized training in those fields. But it is essentially a police academy. But uh, there is no such academy now. As I said um, in the first segment, police cadets uh, used to, I think they still do, um, attend the Guyana Defense Force Standard Officers course at Tamiri. You, you, you know, you, you, you've sort of talked about 
the bigger threats and the big events. So what about the, the man in, the, in, 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 in his home, uh, man and woman in, in, in their homes, uh, that are subjected to robberies? And that seems to be a very, I, I've become the victim of one. Uh, and you seldom hear of after a robbery has taken place that there's been any prosecution. That suggests to me that there's something wrong with the detective side of our, uh, 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 am I right? Well, there could be several things wrong. One could be that, one could be graft, um, in which uh, there is evidence that from time to time police have received inducements, bribe, mm -hmm. um, to not to investigate or not to prosecute or bring to um, trial um, some cases. Sometimes they might be in league with the criminals. I don't know how widespread that is. But many of the problems stem from the fact that illegal guns are brought into the country. There are about three armed robberies every day in Ghana, one robbery every eight hours. That's what I mean. Um, so I'm looking at um, stopping the problem at source, that is to prevent illegal firearms from entering the country. That is why the police force would need to be better trained and have equipment like aircraft, all-terrain vehicles, and boats. So that's where the problem starts. There are other social problems, of course, that there are far too many youngsters dropping out of school. Um, every year, March or Easter time, we put 16 or 17,000 children into the national grade six examinations. Many of them drop out. Many of them end up semi-literate or maybe completely literate because they don't complete the schooling. And some of them are um, inducted into criminal network. Do so we have to find out where these criminals are coming from. Mm -hmm. Because the other day, um, I think you would have read in the newspaper, a 15-year-old was involved in a robbery. Well, uh, I also read in the news shot dead. newspaper that, that, uh, that there were some youngsters uh, carry, carrying, a, I think, an M16 on the way to the prisons. Yeah, so it is not just, um, it is not just um, a matter of street policing. Other things are likely to be happening in society, in the education system, in the families, um, in the schools, um, because there, there's quite a, a lot of violence sometimes in schools. I think um, uh, that day at the Richard Ishmael School, a, a student, a 16 year old student was stabbed, uh, luckily not fatally. But um, policing has to go um, step by step with what is taking place in the rest of society. But there is need for police to receive the type of training which could help to make society, make communities safer. The police force has set up something called a, um, the Community Policing Group, CPG, and they set up neighborhood policing. But these concepts are not applied in the way that we feel that they should be applied. They've also established a citizen security program. In fact, there is a, a nearly a 20 million US dollar program uh, from the IDB. It's not mm -hmm. a grant, it's a loan. But instead of dealing with policing as such, it is committed to what they call citizen security. And it is a device that was used in certain Latin American countries in um, post-conflict situations, you know, like in Colombia or Guatemala, which had um, civil, almost um, civil war, near civil wars. But it was meant to wean uh, youngsters away from, you know, criminal activities to do socially acceptable work, you know, like playing games and mm -hmm. work. But in Guyana, those programs, the citizen security program, the community policing groups, the neighborhood policing, have not really worked. So coming back to the problem facing the householder, we need a new approach to policing so that the householder, the citizen, the person in the street could be protected. But it has to bear in mind uh, the, the social problems that have uh, occurred in, in society as well. You need, for example, in the case of domestic violence, you need more women police um, persons who can deal with those cases sympathetically. You need a community policing system which identifies threats. Sometimes you hear in Wakanam or Leguan some 60 or 70 year old woman raped and murdered. Mm. But there must be some way 
in that community where the threats are discovered early. If you go to Wakanam now, you'd see a little monument to an 11-year-old schoolgirl who's raped and murdered at the spot there. Um, but there, there is some reason why that occurred. Maybe we can have a community policing system which identifies vulnerable persons, vulnerable areas, vulnerable situations, and tries to act proactively, tries to, to forestall the type of criminality because they might be youngsters who are just layabouts and um, they see young girls going up and down and one day they just um, uh, hold on to her and rape her. But there have been a lot of unsolved murders, not just your, the robbery, but there have been a lot of unsolved murders because the system of policing is still based on having three or four policemen in something called a police station rather than going out and doing real community policing. And earning the confidence of the public. That's right. Community policing is not a group. It is, it is, not, it is a process by which the regular police interact with the community, identify threats, and work with the community to overcome those threats. That is what community policing is all about. When the private sector recently met with the Commissioner of Police, and of course that was driven by the Harding matter, which I, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions on in a minute, um, we pretty well said to him that we felt that the public credibility, the public confidence in the police force was being rapidly eroded. Um, do you share that view? It is true that there is, well, my I can't say it's true, it's my perception too that confidence is eroded. And there have been many public manifestations of um, dissatisfaction with police behavior over the years. And uh, in the case of Calvin Harding, as you mentioned, if that's what you spoke to the commissioner about. It goes all the way back to the uh, Twyan Thomas and the Leonora case, because even right. some nuns had come out about that. And although the youngster was given some compensation, uh, there's no, I think the case against the persons, the three policemen who were involved, I think the cases were actually dismissed. And um, it, it, it was I, some, I a very disturbing exactly event. The details, but I, I have a, was there a, didn't they buy their way out of it? <laughs> I can't use that expression. Um, there was an investigation by the Office of Professional Responsibility. I, I don't mean bribe, bribe. I, I meant uh, um, the, didn't the family decide that they would accept uh, money instead of proceeding? I the know case? the state had paid, I think it's about $6.5 million. But I, mm. I cannot give you the details of the actual trial, whether evidence was offered. Um, Do you agree with that, 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 that uh, cases should be dropped just because the family concerned have decided they would take money? Of course not. A crime is a crime. And if somebody um, drives a, 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 his SUV recklessly and you know, slams a university, a student into a wall and kills him, I don't think the family should accept money. You, the crime of uh, causing death by dangerous driving should be prosecuted. And there's evidence that, um, that uh, in some circumstances, persons who have committed criminal offenses were not brought uh, does, but before doesn't the, the law, state, before Doesn't the, the state become complicit, in effect, when they, they go in that direction rather than proceeding with the prosecution? Well, the, the courts themselves might the feel... Courts also. The courts would be limited because they cannot uh, uh, prosecute someone who refuses to give evidence. You know, but maybe the police could, maybe the director of public prosecution could. Um, if, if you bring a case against a person, um, it might be a case of malicious prosecution. And because if you decide not to give evidence, you know, well, well, why did you bring the case? Why are you wasting the court's time? I don't think it can happen in any other jurisdiction. I don't think it can happen in the United States if somebody complains of it. I haven't heard of it in any other country, That's actually, right. It's uh, a uniquely Guyanese cop-out. Mm. And I, I do believe that the, at the level of the DPP and the level of the, the government, action can be taken. I don't know if the courts can uh, initiate charges against a person who refuses to give evidence. But certainly, um, somebody in the system, probably at the level of the DPP, could do so. Would you like to comment any further on the Harding controversy? 
Well, I'll the, call it that for the moment. Yes, I would. I would comment. I don't mind commenting on it because we have established in Guyana something called a police complaints authority, and as I pointed out a little earlier, that PCA has to be given strong investigative powers, so that when a complaint such as the Calvin Harding incident occurs or is made to the, the PCA an investigation could be done, conducted. I do not have confidence that the Office of Professional Responsibility could conduct such an investigation. The Office of Professional Responsibility is a section in the Commissioner's Office and can only initiate investigation into matters the Commissioner directs them to. But he has done, he has, in this case, he has done so. Well, I looked at the report of the investigation in the Leonora torture matter and the report that was published was heavily redacted. Pages were missing. So what is the, the public is being fed um, inadequate information. What I'm saying is that the Police Complaints Authority must be given teeth, must be given investigative capability so that when matters like the Calvin Harding uh, thing, uh, situation occurs, he can do that. But, but coming, but let me come back, before you come, let me come back to the point about training of the police force. If that constable is well trained, if that constable's um, supervising officers were well trained, it wouldn't have reached there. Mm. The supervisor would have been on his, he would have gotten a report. This thing occurred on the 15th of November, and, and it was not until the 15th of January, two months later, when the media got hold of it, that it became a scandal. And when we met with the commissioner of police, he said it came to him late. He didn't deny that. Well, it should come to him next morning. There has been an incident at Temeri Police Station or Ramville Police Station, and he calls for an investigation right away. Why did this occur? Was the man taken to hospital? What I'm saying in a well-trained police in force... In fact, the commander of the division also said he did not know about it until much later. Well, they need to be disciplined all along the system. Information like that should be transmitted as soon as possible after it has occurred as possible. But that would be the subject of the inquiry, would it not? What, what went wrong in the system? Well, I mean, regardless of whether what Harding says is true or not, he clearly was, he clearly was assaulted in some way. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any denial of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there seemed to be an inordinate time before that information came up the system. Well, my own familiarity with uniform services, discipline forces, is that certainly within 24 hours, some responsible superior officer should have known about the incident. I mean, the commission of police, when we met him, didn't, didn't bury that. He, 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 he admitted it. He, mm -hmm. he said he was not informed and he was very upset about it. Well, what, um, what I could refer to now is the practice in the Guyana Police Force simply to transfer officers and other persons who have been known to commit offenses. Instead of disciplining them, you know, somebody is sent to some hinterland location, you send them to Madia, but it doesn't solve the problem. But you know, David, if I may interrupt you there, that seemed to be a practice in the police force for as long as I can remember. Even when I was a minister in the <laughs> government, well, it's time to put it to an end. That, because that was a practice. We he just moved them somewhere else. Transferring the problem. And if we, if we want a, a better trained police force, a, better, a more disciplined police force, a more efficiently managed police force, we have to stop that. That, you know, there's not much you can do with a rotten orange. <laughs> I mean, I, what, I imagine your comment would be obvious, but what's your comment on what happened at 51? Well, again, that is being my own information is that the crime is unlikely to have been committed by the police. I was given that information by somebody who took the trouble to investigate right. it. But, um, but I was talking about the whole, the wholesale transfer of the. Um, yeah, well, th well, that that is is not a solution to the problem. So where do those officers go? And if they caused a problem where they were, won't they the problem? be transferred with them. Exactly. Um, that is why it is necessary to have an independent judicial inquiry into these matters. You had a situation in which um, 
uh, three girls were accused of wandering, and quickly there was an inquiry. And I do believe that there must be inquiries um, outside of the Office of Professional Responsibility, outside of the police force, which can deal with these issues quickly. And they can recommend action to be taken against the police officers if they are at fault. Similarly, in the, in the case of the torture of the boy at Leonora, similarly in the case of the alleged torture of Colvin Harding. But unless you have investigations to collect the evidence and make recommendations, you are going to have a recycling of, of, of bad cops. What about, I, I brought up the, 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 the matter of, of the capacity and capability of the, the detective uh, section of the police force. Um, we don't even have DNA detection facilities in this country. Why is that? I do believe that from the evidence that is available to me, um, during the period of the Troubles, what I call the Troubles, that is roughly between 2000 and 2010, uh, some parts of the police force were deliberately um, neutered, incapacitated, eviscerated, whatever you want to say. And when you read the report, into the report of the PCI, the Presidential Commission of Inquiry into the conduct of Mr. Gadraj, you see hints that um, a parallel system was being set up to conduct investigation. And Mr. Gadraj more or less said, you know, he didn't have confidence in the police, and that's why he recruited um, a certain person, and that's why a person was given a gun, although the person was known to have committed murder, um, because he, he felt the police officers um, were afraid and they weren't capable of committing, of conducting proper investigation. No, it is quite clear that a lot, there was a lot of extrajudicial killing in that period. In fact, the police have a monument there in Evelary, which indicates that more policemen were killed in that period, the period of the Troubles, than ever before or since in the history of the Guyana police force. So it is my view, and I have not been contradicted, that some elements, particularly the CID, um, some elements were deliberately weakened during that period to prevent them from conducting their work. And many of the murders are unsolved. And as a result of that, we had a situation in which equipment was given to um, a criminal, and he used that equipment to listen to... You're talking about Roger Khan? Yeah, Roger Khan, I'm talking about Roger Khan. And um, a lot of people were killed, assumedly by a phantom gang, and the word phantom was used by the head of the presidential secretary, Mr. Roger, Dr. Roger Lunchan. So instead of investigations being conducted, we saw summary executions. I do not think that up to the present time, the CID has recovered from the mauling it got in that period. And let me add something very important. A minister of this government was assassinated. And I was going to ask you about that anyway. A Mr. Satideo right. saw. An inquiry was never conducted. But every single witness or potential witness or any person whose name was mentioned as being a witness was killed. Mm -hmm. Many of them by the police in so-called shootouts. And the mm -hmm. deputy that, commissioner... That's a pretty serious Mr. accusation to make. Mr. Mr. I'm not accusing, I'm speaking the truth. Mr. Silal Prasad, the uh, deputy commissioner of police, and I can give you the quotation. Is that documented? It is a newspaper report that Mr. Silal Prasad said that the investigation is going nowhere because all of the witnesses were killed. No, but I was asking you about, uh, you're suggesting that the witnesses were assassinated deliberately. Well, it was a massacre. The minister was assassinated. No, I mean subsequent to, the, to, the, to that murder. Well, subsequent to that murder... You're suggesting that the witnesses were assassinated and therefore there was no prosecution. It is hard to kill 18 witnesses into the assassination of a minister of the government, a serving minister of the government, without the reasonable suspicion mm. that it was deliberate. That it was deliberate. Mm. There's no actual evidence of that. There's no evidence, but uh, there is a quotation from Mr. Silal Prasad that every witness had been eliminated. 
We've got the last a, one who was brought before the court um, died suddenly in custody. I think he was in hospital. Right. Died suddenly. David, it's been a very fascinating discussion with you. You've got about another five minutes. Uh, let me give you those five minutes to sum up where you think we need to go from here. First of all, in the last 15 years, there has been a substantial amount of information and recommendations on the reform of the Ghana Police Force. We need to visit um, all of that information. I think the British um, DFID conducted a, in the studies in good faith, and we shouldn't throw it through the window. Um, secondly, we need particularly to look back at the report of the Discipline Forces Commission, and even the government of Ghana made some sensible proposal. They set up their own um, uh, consultancies with Bishop Edgehill. I don't think they were a waste of time. They were quite mm -hmm. voluminous. They were consultation, not consultancy, consultations with the public. And uh, as I said, I, was, I myself was a member of the Border and National Security Commission. I was a member of the Discipline Forces Commission. I used to be a member of the National Drug Law Enforcement Commission. The reports are there. And a serious attempt should be made to use those reports, which have been accumulated over the last 15 years, to make the Ghana Police Force a better, uh, a better force to serve, and for people to serve. It. And there must be better training. We need to ensure that policemen are trustworthy. And we need to ensure that the course of training, we shouldn't just do the training that was done 10, 20, 30 years ago. We must look at giving them modern training so that they can enter the modern world. They can be on par with Barbadian, Surinamese, and other um, policemen in terms of intelligence, in terms of commitment to the work, and also perhaps in terms of being paid better. But I do believe, I do have faith in the police force, I do believe we can have a better police force, and we cannot have a safer country unless we have a better police force. What about, quickly, the role of the GDF? The GDF has a role in territorial integrity, and they have a role in, um, through the Coast Guard, in protecting our borders, our maritime borders. And also, they're better equipped uh, because of the access to aircraft and the capability in aircraft. Um, I don't think the police force should try to set up a separate air wing. I don't think they know what they're talking about. But the Guyana Police um, Defense Force could do a lot more work in border security. I think they were misused in trying to use them as a sort of riot squad, keeping them around Georgetown. Mm -hmm. But my point of view is that they should prevent the guns from coming in, they should prevent contraband, they should prevent piracy from taking place. And we need to use them in that protective role at a national level and not, them, not get them involved in, in street crime. In so you don't feel they should be more intimately involved in the, in, the, in, the, in the traditional role of the police? No, the police have their role, the police must be strengthened and the only reason the Guyana Defense Force was deployed um, in certain areas during the Troubles, you know, 2003 to 2005, is because of the apparent weakness of the police force. I see a stronger police force, and the Guyana Defense Force should be allowed to play its role. And its role is to suppress piracy, protect our coastland, and protect our borders. And they have an important role to play in that regard. You think they're doing it? They don't have the equipment to do it. They don't have the boats. You think they're properly trained? <laughs> they need to be better trained. They need to be re-equipped, particularly, I think there was a long complaint in the newspaper about the Air Corps, mm. and I think the Coast Guard. I think those two technical arms have to be re-equipped. Well, they don't have the, the, the equipment for, um, for rescue. Well, and that's an aviation issue. When I speak about training of the police force, um, I related to the situation in the Ghana Defense Force as well. Yeah. We need to develop the scientific arms, the technical arms of those two services. And in the Ghana, in, in the Ghana Defense Force particularly, the Air Corps, the Engineer Corps, and the Coast Guard mm -hmm. are the more important technical arms which have to be um, equipped and developed. And you, you, you think the answer to that is an academy? The Defense Force has a, an academy, but the police force uh, needs an academy. Okay. But they also, you need to walk on two legs. The academy uh, is necessary, but not sufficient. You also need to look at the other factors which have been mentioned. As I said, there's 71 recommendations from the Discipline Force. What about Commission entry Bill. into the police force and the standards for that? Well, I think that looking at the education system now, even looking at what happens at the University of Ghana, you need remedial training. And the entry level, um, 
the police force has to be prepared to bring the entrant up to the standard that is required for modern policing. You can't just accept what comes off the street now. You have to do remedial training. One last question to you, David. Uh, your government is elected. Uh, would you, where would you rate your priorities regarding security? With the police force, with the retraining of the police force, re-equipping the police force, I think an APNU, I would like to say, not I think, I know that an APNU will be committed first to making the country safe so that other, you know, that citizens, businessmen, miners, fish folk, tourists would feel comfortable coming to Guyana. That is the type of Guyana I look forward to seeing in 2016 when we celebrate our 50th anniversary of independence, a safe country. Brigadier David Granger, we've been talking for just about an hour on security. I want to thank you very much indeed. I will remind you that this program is a program hosted by the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and that uh, they very kindly asked me to interview David. Thank you for listening. <laughs>